So we're going to talk a little bit about your journey through pulmonary hypertension. We're going to talk about what you go through, maybe as a patient, some testing, what it means, and how this can help you. And so let's, let's look at the objectives for this, this topic. So we're going to distinguish between PH and PAH, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And as a patient, you've probably heard both terms. So we want to kind of dive into that for a little bit. And then we're going to talk about the different groups and the functional class of PH. Uh, understand diagnosing, treating, and managing pH. Understand treatment goals for pH. And that is a very important one, treatment goals. It's all about your goal, right? And then we're going to describe testing and understand test results for pulmonary hypertension. And then we're going to talk about appropriate treatment plan that might be good for you. So what is pulmonary hypertension? What is pH? pH refers to high blood pressure in the vessels of the lungs from any cause. Um, we wish we knew more about it. We've come a long way, but we still don't know enough. It primarily affects blood vessels in the lungs, making the right side of the heart work just a little bit harder. So right side of your heart is going to work a little bit harder. And then there's several different types of pulmonary hypertension, and we will go into those a little bit. So how do we define it? I don't want you to get caught too much in the definition. I just want you to know, as a provider, this is what we look at to help figure out if what you have and what is going on with you, right? So the definition is defined by presence of abnormally high pulmonary vascular pressure. So you probably have heard the word hypertension. You, a lot of people have high blood pressure. So this is what we're referring to. We're referring to high pressure, but different, not high blood pressure in your body, but in your lungs. So the hemodynamic definition is your mean pulmonary arterial pressure greater than 25 millimeters of mercury. Again, don't get too caught up on that. So what is pulmonary arterial hypertension? PAH is a type of pulmonary hypertension. It's rare, chronic, and currently incurable disease. And I'm sure as a patient, you've been told that. Um, if not, it's incurable disease. And it causes walls of the arteries of the lungs to tighten and stiffen. And in a patient with PAH, the right side of the heart has to work harder to push the blood through the narrowed arteries of the lungs. This just puts extra stress on your heart vessels. And let's just flip to this slide because it kind of gives you a picture. And what I want you to think of, if, if you think of an old water pipe in your house and you think of how it gets corroded, it, if you think about the corrosion and the resistance of over time, that pipe in your house becomes corroded and the water to pump through gets a little bit harder. So this is kind of what I'm showing you in this. Um, I, I put a very simplified uh, artery up there just so you could see the difference. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about that stiffen or that resistance of the artery. So how do we define PAH? Remember, we defined PH. Now how do we define PAH? So it's caused by an increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance, makes it hard for that blood to flow through, and then it causes restriction in the blood flow through the pulmonary arterial circulation, which leads to ultimate right heart failure. And you see the definition is a little more involved. We look at a few other numbers, and where do we get these numbers? We get those from your right heart catheterization, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this slide, so I won't, I won't go through it here. So what is the difference between the two? So PH, PAH, right? I told you it was a general term. It describes the high blood pressure, but the difference is it's rare, chronic, and the, really the big difference is, is when we look at this, the, the definition, the numbers, okay? And again, it puts extra stress on the heart, which I'm not going to read this because we just said this. So we talk about classification systems. So all of you, when you come to your provider, we try to figure out which group you are. There are five classification groups for pulmonary arterial hypertension. We didn't have this in the beginning. Dr. McConnell talked about when we first started in pulmonary hypertension years ago. We didn't have this. We didn't have groups. This came out later. So we've come a long way. So you could be in any of these groups depending on what's causing your pulmonary hypertension. So we have group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. We have group two, which is due to the left side of your heart. That does play a role. And then we have group three, which is lung disease hypoxia, lack of oxygen, decreased oxygen levels. And then we have group four, which is your chronic thromboembolic pH, which we call CTEF, right? And then we have group five, which is everything else, unclear, multifactorial. We also talk about clinical classification. I want you to look at the, clini the, the clinical classification of pH. And again, it lists your PAH, it lists your left heart, it lists the, the uh, group three, which is your lung and hypoxia, chronic 
thromboembolic, the CTEF, and then the, uh, the other category, group five. And here's some just examples, some etiology, what we call etiologies, but it kind of gives you some ideas. You might think, oh, I have COPD. Was I group three? Or I have, I have some heart failure, some left heart failure. Was I group two? So those are things you need to discuss with your provider, right? Nothing here is going to be more important that we tell you than discussion with your provider. That is key to have that conversation. We also talk about functional class. This is really why we ask you a zillion questions when you come in to see us, right? We want to know what you're doing. We want to know your functional ability every day because our goal is for you to have a better quality of life. So we talk about these classes, and it's New York Heart Association, class one, two, three, or four. And if you've ever been to a support group meeting, sometimes we present this to you and we talk about these. And if you just notice the definitions again, you guys, everyone can read these. And if you notice each class, the higher the number, the worse you your symptoms, the worse you may be. So if you notice, class one symptoms do um, not limit, no, no limit in your physical activity, right? And as you go down and the number gets higher, you have slight limitation, you have marked limitation, and then you have inability to carry out any physical activity. And, re and even at rest, you might be short of air. So you might come in and we say, Mr. Smith, you're functional class two. And we might talk to you a little bit. And then at the end of your visit, we might think either you're about the same or you, you're a little bit worse. You might have progressed to functional class three. As a provider, that is our goal to try to not have you not progress to a worse functional class. And we want to actually risk stratify you to a lower functional class if we can. So we work a lot on that. So again, you might ask your provider, where do you see me? And that's why we ask you questions. And that's why we tell you to bring a support person to your appointment with you because we, we want to hear what they have to say about you also in front of you. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting. You might tell us that you couldn't walk to get your mail and then your caregiver or your a significant other says, what do you mean? You just walked around the mall yesterday. So that's, that's how we sort of um, figure out where you are in your functional class. So let's talk about some causes of uh, PAH. So I want you, in this little slide, I want you to think biology. We're looking at uncontrolled inflammation in the arteries. And this causes the muscular uh, layers and the blood vessels um, to thicken and narrow. And then we also talk about blood clotting system. Um, it is inappropriately activated inside the pulmonary artery and therefore... Um, you can get microscopic, really small clots. Sometimes, you know, we want you to go undergo uh, what we call a VQ scan to look for small, really small clots that maybe a CAT scan doesn't pick up. And then the artery will begin, will begin to narrow and thicken. Remember, we talked about that resistance, the water going through the pipe. That's what ends up happening. It just makes it harder for the blood to pump lungs to the heart out to the rest of the body. So causes of PAH, in many cases, the cause of PAH is unknown and it's referred to as idiopathic. Idiopathic, that's, that's that PAH who group, that's the group one that we talk about, right? So we don't know what causes it. We wish we did. We've, again, we've come a long way, but we don't know. And then in other cases, it's associated with genetics or uh, another condition. And I just listed some of them here. You might have had a congenital heart disease, and you might be told that. Uh, it also HIV, liver disease, connective tissue disease like lupus or scleroderma. So you might be one of those that you have a connective tissue disease, and we tell you that's your cause of your PAH. So who can get it, right? So who can get PAH? It can affect everyone, right? All people, ages, races, it li listen, it does not discriminate. We know it goes across the board all through every lifespan, right, of, of a of child all the way up. So anybody can get this. There's genetic counseling that can help um, with these issues. So if you have someone in your family, sometimes we may refer you to genetic counseling. We may want to know, or you may want to know. So that's always we can, we can um, send you there. And then gender-specific um, so in gender, it's more common in women than men, uh, both idiopathic and heritable, right? Heritable, family, your genetics. You can't pick it, right? You can't choose your genetics. And then uh, disease such as connective tissue, as I said, congenital heart, uh, HIV, and liver diseases, that can cause it. That, those are the people that can get it. And then also other drugs and toxins. And I did list uh, just an example, methamphetamine. And if you remember the diet drugs, the fin-fin drugs back in the day, those can also cause. 
So what are some common signs and symptoms? And I want you just to look at this diagram for a moment, and I want you to look at those signs and symptoms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And what is the first thing you notice? Very vague, right? Very vague symptoms, very common symptoms that can fit a lot of different diagnoses that you that may have affected you in another disease that you have or another illness that you've had. So that is the problem, dry coughing. We see that with a lot of different illnesses, right? Bluish lips or skin, chest pain. So you can just see some of these shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, um, lightheadedness, dry coughing, abnormal bloating, rapid weight gain, swollen ankles or legs. Again, very vague. Therefore, it makes us as a provider, that's why we have to do a lot of other testing to figure out what's causing it. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. What does that mean? That means we do a lot of other testing to rule out what it's not, all right? That's how we get to this diagnosis. So it's complex. It involves multiple steps to rule out other possible disease process, processes. We use a diagnostic algorithm to establish your WHO group. Remember your WHO groups? There were five of those, right? So we use, a, we use an algorithm to figure that out. And then the suspicion of pH may arise in various ways. Therefore, testing may vary for you. So you might be in a support group, and you might be talking to a friend in a support group who also has pH, and they may not have undergone the same testing that you did. It depends, again, on all the things we've already just listed, your, your family, your medical history, you know, anything genetic, things like that. So that's why we um, have various testing that you may undergo. How is it diagnosed? Um, again, lots of testing. This is what really the uh, take home of this PowerPoint is I want you to know. We're gonna talk about testing through your journey and what the tests mean. Uh, because you might have a test and say, I don't know what that is, or why did they order that? Again, I always encourage you, ask your provider. There is no question that is not worth asking, right? So how, did, how do we diagnose it? Again, we kind of went through some of this already. And if you look at it, it's difficult um, to diagnose because of those, that slide that I showed you with the common signs and symptoms. So you may come in and we take a very detailed medical history. That's what we're going to do first. We're going to, the, the medical assistant's going to ask you a lot of questions. The, anybody drawing your lab might ask you questions. And then we start asking you questions. And we want to know these things about you. We want to know if you've had angina or chest pain or dyspnea on exertion. Or if you, just shortness of breath while you're sitting there. We want to know these kinds of things. Exercise intolerance, fatigue, um, your history of medical illnesses, syncope or presyncope. Are you getting dizzy? Do you feel like you're going to pass out? Things like that. And then we look at risk factors. Again, that's why we ask you your family history. We want to know these types of things from your family, liver disease, anybody with connective tissue disease, uh, congenital disease, hypertension, things like that. So again, we also take a physical exam. That is key. We do a great physical exam. So we get your medical history first, and then we're going to examine you. And I didn't really list a lot of uh, what the heart sounds and the lung sounds, because that's you can get that later in a breakout session. I just wanted to give you um, a little bit, uh, kind of the general picture of what we're looking at for physical exam. And it's we obtain this, we look at your pulse oximeter. I know all of you probably know what that is on your finger, right? And then you, we look at your, your neck veins. We look at fluid in your neck veins, which is called elevated jugular venous pressure. We look at that, we measure that. Ascites, abdominal swelling, right? lower extremity edema, ankle edema, even, even in your thighs or your legs. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term dependent edema. And then abnormal heart sounds. Again, we listen for different heart sounds that go along with PAH. And then signs of right heart failure. All right, we look at those, which there's different signs of right heart failure, swelling, ascites, things like that, shortness of breath. We look at those things. And then we're going to order testing. And this is what you all love. We put you, we put you through the test. We put you through the ringer, right? So we're, we order laboratory testing. We order a six-minute walk test. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as MWT on a, an order form if you see it. We look at your EKG, your echocardiogram, uh, CT lung scan, really VQ scan is what we want for PAH. It's the gold standard. Um, pulmonary function testing, overnight sleep study, chest x-ray, and right heart cath. So let's talk about a few of these. Laboratory testing, what are we going to look at? We're going to do a CBC, a BMP, just your common chemistries, electrolytes in your body. CBC looks at your white blood cell count, your hemoglobin, your platelets. We're going to look at your liver function test. 
all right? Because we know pulmonary hypertension medicine, some of them, this is one of the side effects, elevated LFTs. So we check that. We look at either pro-BNP or BNP, depending on your, your center where you practice. Connective tissue disease-specific labs. Quite a few of those. I didn't list them all out here, but we check for that. And then we also look at an ABG, which is your arterial blood gas. That's the stick that really hurts that you all, you know, don't like, and I wouldn't either. So when we do a six-minute walk test, I know if I said raise your hand, all of you that are a pH patient in here probably have had one. Um, so you may see it again listed as an MWT, 6-MWT. The name suggests it, what it says. It's exactly a walk for six minutes or how long you can go, right? And we have a specific meters we like for you to achieve. And again, you will get that a little bit more in a breakout session. You can ask that question in a breakout session today. That's not really, I'm just giving you the overview. Uh, we look at your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, or your pulse oximeter, called a couple different things. And then we, we record your walk distance, right? We, we see how far you walk in meters, and we measure that. And then this test checks for functional ability of patients with pH. Believe it or not, the six-minute walk test gives providers a lot of information about you. We don't want to just bring you in. We're not just bringing you in to work you out, right? It, it gives us a lot of information that we need. And it's typ I said typically done every office visit, but it it's, depends on your center. Every other depends on some. Some do it every visit in the beginning, but then it, we, we spread them out. So it's not really done every office visit. And then CPET testing, cardio exercise pulmonary testing. You may not have had this or you might have, depending, again, on your center where you're treated. So what does this look at? This allows the assessment of integrative cardiopulmonary pulmonary response to exercise. Um, this also is usually performed with a patient exercising on a stationary bike. And then I, I didn't really go into the levels we measure with that, but there are levels we measure in your blood. Um, and then it's a useful tool to assess the underlying patho pathophysiological mechanism leading to exercise intolerance. So as we look at like the pathophysiology behind what's going on when you exercise. And then many variables are measured and obtained and provide useful um, prognostic information in patients with PAH. Again, it's one of the many testing you might have to get to your diagnosis, okay? And an EKG. All of you have had an EKG. It, it, it is a very simple, easy to do, non-invasive test, measures the electricity in your heart. You don't feel the electricity, but that's what we're looking at. We put the electrodes on the chest, arms, and legs. Again, I know this is very general information, but we just want you to understand the test. And then, obviously, you don't feel this, and then it gives us information about how fast and regular the heart is beating, and it just gives us a general idea um, and sense of your global function of your heart. And we're going to talk about that in the next test. So that's your EKG. So go down, let's just go down, your VQ scan, ventilation perfusion. Um, this is a scan that you probably have had where you have some dye and different things like that, and then we, we, they have some blood, you get some blood tests. So it looks for blood clots in the lungs. It involves exposure to a very small amount of radiation. Uh, the test makes you, or the test, this test makes sure your pH is not caused by blood clots in the lungs. And if you remember your, your groups, right, that's group, that's group four. That was that group that we showed you that was called CTEF. So that's what, that's what this scan is looking for. And again, is we're looking for really small clots that maybe a CT scan does not pick up. A CT, it, sometimes you, it's called CTA. And then two tests combined into one. So the ventilation part, the V part of the test, right, uh, tells us which part of the lungs are getting air into them. And then the Q stands for perfusion. So we're looking at two different things here. And then, then that's which part of the lung the blood is going, right? So VQ, you're going to hear that. Echocardiogram. So you did. we did the EKG. So then most of you, we do an echocardiogram. We have to get the pressures from the echocardiogram. So it's a non-invasive ultrasound. You probably, the transducer over your heart, the cold gel, that sort of thing. Um, it's a non-invasive ultrasound test of the heart, which does not involve radiation. Very easy to do. Um, multiple images and recordings of your heart obtained. This gives us a general idea about the size and function and interaction of your heart and the different chambers. Again, looks at kind of the global function. We want to look at all that. And then we ass and it also assesses your heart valve. So we can see all four heart valves here, see how they're pumping, or I'm sorry, four chambers of your heart. And then we look at the heart valves and see how they're opening and closing. So we can also look at your, you know, your right atrium, your right ventricle, your left atrium, your left ventricle, and the echocardiogram. 
And I just put a picture in here. We don't need to, I won't go to the, the uh, measurements here. But this is kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at um, the characteristics of a patient on echocardiogram. You see the chambers of the heart. And you can see where that the long red arrow is pointing. We call that the septum. So um, if, you, if you're looking at the, the larger picture, you can see that that septum is flattened. So that is something that um, we key into for when we're looking at your echocardiogram if we suspect you might have pulmonary hypertension. And then irrespective of the pressure measurement, the heart is slightly, this heart on the smaller picture is highly suspicious for PAH based on structural changes. And we just kind of give you some ideas here. Uh, you see where the smaller arrow is pointing, you see that little curved area at the bottom, that's some fluid, that's called a pericardial effusion. So these are just an example of some of the things we look at. We look at a lot more than that, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of the uh, pictures we're looking at on your echocardiogram. Pulmonary function testing. Again, most of you probably have had this, especially if you have some lung disease, we want to look at this. So it's that test where we sit you in the chamber and we, the respiratory therapist or um, an aide in there, they have you breathe in and out and do all these funny breathing tests, breathing and breathe certain ways. So it gives us a lot of information also about your breathing. It's non-invasive and it measures uh, different aspects of your breathing. Uh, it may show different causes of patient shortness of breath, such as COPD, asthma, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, if, you've, if you're a pulmonary fibrosis patient, you know, which is lung scarring. So it looks at those kinds of things. And then it also gives us some spirometry, how fast you breathe out. We look at lung volumes. We look at your lung volume, which is the ability to breathe in and out. We look at your diffusion capacity. So if you hear some of these words, this might give you a little idea of what we're looking for. The diffusion capacity reflects the extent of damage to the blood vessels in the lungs. So those are kind of a few of the measurements we look at. It gives us a whole page of measurements that we put together. And then overnight sleep study. We've come a long way with overnight sleep studies. Um, we can do them at home. Some centers will let you take one home and do it. So if, if we think that maybe this is the cause of your pulmonary hypertension, remember the group three that we talked about? the lung diseases, and the hypoxia, sometimes uh, obstructive sleep apnea, if you're wearing a CPAP or BiPAP machine, can be the cause. So um, poor quality sleeping, we know, can lead to pulmonary hypertension, and it also leads to many more diseases, cardiac disease, hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, because it just puts undue stress on your heart if you have poor quality sleeping in the middle of the night. You know, we might ask you and the person that you bring to your appointment, do they snore? Do they stop breathing in their sleep? Do you feel them gasp or, or do they wake up because they're gasping? Those types of questions. So low O2 levels while sleeping, we know put, put a strain on your lung and your hearts, right? On your hearts, on your heart. That is a given, we know that. It's done in a sleep center or a home sleep study. You can take the machine home, set it up. The, and it's a lot of people like to sleep in their own bed. I get that. And then overnight oximetry also can be done. That's not a sleep study. That's where we put that pulse oximeter on your finger and we record your oxygen levels while you're sleeping all night. This, is continue, this continually monitors these and it also looks at your heart rate because we know most of the time if your oxygen levels are dropping, your heart rate's doing something. It's probably dropping or maybe you have atrial fibrillation and your, your oxygen level is dropping. So those kinds of things. So we monitor your heart rate also. We also look at the chest x-ray and imaging. This is a great tool, just a very basic, you know, snap of your chest. Um, it's usually one of the first tests done, probably that, with some blood work in your EKG. It takes one, two pictures of the lungs, very simple. Uh, shows gross abnormalities in the lungs. Doesn't pick up a, a, enough, that's why we send you for the VQ scan, that's why we do the echocardiogram may not be sensitive enough to find subtle or small abnormalities, so that's why we test you further. And we may have to do a CT scan. You know, especially if we know you have some lung disease, chest x-ray gives us, you know, like the gross picture of it, the big things, but we also might do a, just a CAT scan of your lungs to get the smaller, the smaller abnormal things going on. So right heart cath. This is what we really want to talk about. This is the gold standard. You cannot be diagnosed with pulmonary arterial hypertension without a right heart catheterization. It is the gold standard for confirming pH. Um, it also quantifies the severity 
of your pH because it gives us a lot more numbers than your echocardiogram, certain things we're looking for. It's invasive. You go to the cath lab, right? Pulmonary pulmonologists do them, and so do cardiologists. Um, so you're going to go to the cath lab. There's going to be a physician there. They're going to introduce a catheter into a vein. Um, sometimes it's a brachial vein. Sometimes it can go through the neck. Sometimes you go through the groin. So it depends on the person doing it and your cath lab. And what are we looking for? We're going to measure pressures of the right side of your heart. That's what we're looking for. Um, it's not a left heart catheterization. Some of you might have had a left heart when they're looking for coronary art artery disease. This is the right side of the heart. So measure pressures in the right side of your heart, which is what we really want. And in the large blood vessel, the pulmonary artery, we want to see those pressures. We want to know what that is. This vessel connects the right side of the heart to the lungs. So if you really kind of think about your anatomy, think about your pulmonary artery connecting the lungs and the heart. If there's trouble with that artery and pressures, something's going on, you're, it's, going to, it's going to cause you probably to be short of breath and remember all those signs and symptoms we talked about to have a few of those. So that's why we need these pressures. That's why we do the right heart catheterization. So now that we've talked about a little bit of the background of pH, just an uh, overview, and we've talked about the definitions, we've talked about the testing, what you need done, what we're going to order for you, we're going to put you through the ringer, let's talk about appropriate treatment and management for PAH. So treatment options. While there's no cure, we know there's no cure, it's come a long way, right? And all, even since you've been diagnosed, if you're newly diagnosed, I will tell you, we've come very far in the world of pH and pulmonary. So there's many options, different options available. We used to, again, have nothing but lung transplant um, way back. And then it's one of the only types, PAH is one of the only types of pH which have specific medications approved by the FDA. Again, lucky for all of us, for you, we have many more medications available now. Um, and this is a website I just put up. We're going to give you more websites. Um, I always encourage my patients, don't go to Dr. Google and look up information, right? Go to the PHA website. It has everything, online toolkits. It has more information than you could possibly need, but it will give you really good information. So I put this right here because it does talk about treatment options. And there's the website, but you're going to get that a little bit later today in different information. And then always consult with your health professional. They are the most important. They know you. You have to develop a dialogue, a relationship with them. Again, ask questions. Write questions down. Don't come to your appointment without questions or not writing them down because if you're like me, you're going to forget, right? So we always encourage that. And I just put this slide in because I want you to know when we talk about medications, and again, we'll talk about this a little later, so I don't want to get into the, the actual nitty-gritty of the, of the receptors here on the slide, but I want you to know from this slide, when we talk about medications, we are targeting one of three pathways. And you can see the pathways, and you might have heard us talk about the type of drug you're taking. So we look at the endothelium pathway, certain set of drugs for those, right? You might have heard the, the name ERA, right? Uh, the, the nitric pathway. So we have PDE5s. You might have heard that. And then we have prostacycline pathway. You might have heard of prostacycline drugs. So you might be on one drug. You might be on two drugs. You might be on three drugs. Why is that? Because we don't know which pathway you are. I wish we did. We're hoping research down the road comes up, but we have to target more than one pathway. We have found over time, research has proven that if you treat more than one pathway, you're, we, you, you feel better, we're more successful with your outcome and your goals for pulmonary hypertension. So I just put this in here for that reason, just so that you know with the medications, when you say, why do I have to take three drugs or why do I take two drugs? Remember, we talked about the functional class that's what, our risk, that's what our goal is, is to risk stratify you for a better functional class. It may take two medications to get you there, or three medications to get you there, if that makes sense. So treatment goals. Again, we're not going to go through this slide, but I just wanted to put an example because we might, you might be doing these when you come to your visit. This is what we call a risk calculator. We risk stratify you low, intermediate, or high. And there's a couple different, I just put the European example up here. There's different calculators that your, your physician or your nurse practitioner or nurse might use, ask you questions. We do plug in some numbers from your testing, and then we ask you specific questions. And you might think, they ask me the same questions every time I come in. This is why. We like to risk stratify you. We like to 
get you to your treatment goal. And this is one way we do it. So that's why I put this example up there. So what is our overall treatment goal when you look at the calculator, when we put the numbers in? Your goal is to achieve low risk stratus. Why, status. Why do we do that? We know that if you're low risk, if we can get you to that, into the green zone, we know that it's associated with good exercise, good quality of life. It's all about your quality of life, right? A good RV function. We want that right ventricle of your heart to have the best pumping capability. And then we also know you, you're, you have a low mortality risk. We can look at that and we know that your mortality risk is lower. So that's why we do these things for your treatment goal. And I also just added this one in here. We know there's no cure, but you know, treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Um, again, we want to figure out which functional class you're in, one, two, three, or four. So that's why we ask you these questions. And then we can just put all this together. So I just kind of put this slide in. I put this in last minute because I, I thought when you're, we're talking about your medications, your treatment goal, you might want to think, well, how, what are you measuring? How do you get to that? So the calculator, and then we look at these things. And then let's talk about your general care. Again, I just put a little diagram on here. Because it, I liked this one, it overlaps everybody. Look, it overlaps your PH nurse, your coordinator, your um, providers, your support staff. There is a lot that goes into your journey for PH, and it does involve all these equally. So I would encourage you, you know, you're, you're probably going to know your PH nurse or your nurse practitioner and your physician, right? You're going to know them fairly well. You get to know them. But the other part of this is just as important. Your other providers that we may send you to. If you have connective tissue, you might go see a rheumatologist. Just as important. Your general care, your support staff. It involves all these other areas here. You know, we might send you to cardio, cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab. That is, these are considered your support staff, your general care, um, so I would just tell you, make sure you have a well-rounded team around you. That's going to make you more successful. And then this slide here, I like this one because it's generally, it just looks at patients with pulmonary hypertension, and you can see the different supportive therapy again. You can see that, obviously, we tell you these things. This is your support. This is this supportive measures we, we talk to you about. Avoid pregnancy, um, psychological counseling. Again, I want you to take all these to help you. Use every resource out there available. And you can just see, we talk about um, supplemental oxygen, your companies, your, your um, specialty pharmacy, your, your specialty nurse with those specialty companies that help you with your home treatment. We also look at... Um, Oxygen therapy, your, di your diuretic, your water pill. We look at that type of thing. So I want you just to look at this. Is just some general things that we give you, some general treatment. Um, we also different medications. So you have to be a little familiar with everything you're on. You also need to know when we talk about medications, and I really push this point with patients, you have to know what you have, right? You have to be accountable for your disease. I always make the analogy of a diabetic, the bracelets, the identification. I've, I've really not ever heard a diabetic a, as a patient talk to me and not know what insulin they're on, not know what's going on, not know when their blood sugar drops too low or too high. This is what we're trying to do is give you examples of different things you might be on, but you need to know because if you're out somewhere and you have that what we call syncope or presyncope and you're in public, you want to be able to tell somebody, I have pulmonary hypertension. Basically, don't touch my medications, don't touch my pump, you know, things like that. But we want you to know. We want to empower you, give you all the tools in the toolkit to help you with this. So summary, we're here. So we know PAH is a rare, chronic, and currently incurable disease. The symptoms are nonspecific, therefore that workup is needed. It's a long, cumbersome workup, I know, but once we get to your diagnosis, we can talk about treatment, right? Treatment of PAH includes medications targeting multiple pathways, the three pathways, and then understanding what test results mean for PAH, for PAH diagnosis. It's essential, it's essential for us to determine your appropriate treatment where you're going with your plan. And then be involved. Discuss your treatment with your, your provider, your care team, and understand your test results. If we give you a result of your test or a diagnostic test or a laboratory test and you don't know, please stop your provider and ask. Because again, we want you to be accountable. We want you to understand what you have and we wanna make you the most successful in your journey through PH. 
and I thank you. Thank you.